Great. And we Thank are you. recording. Yep, so you're good to go when you're ready to go. All right. And you have two virtual audience members right now. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the North Carolina Maritime Museum here in Beaufort. My name is Ben, and I work on the education staff. Um, I'll be giving the presentation for today as part of our Maritime Heritage series of educational and informative lectures. What I have set up is a slideshow. So those that are here uh, in the auditorium in the building can observe, and also those that are watching online. So we'll be going through a series of slides. Today's topic is lightships to light towers, illuminating the capes of North Carolina. I do wanna mention that the next lecture that we have scheduled before I get started here uh, will not be until May 11th and it is titled Crusty Clusters, Hidden Treasure, Conservation Basics, Concretions in Archaeological Conservation. Is it a seahorse, a plumbing fixture? What about a really big nail? Sometimes artifacts that are buried in the ocean from special form, special crusts called concretion that change their appearance and hide their identity. And in this lecture, our Conservator Michelle Cripeau will discuss what a concretion is, how it forms, and how conservators break them down to uncover the buried archaeological treasure within. So that will be on May 11th at 11 o'clock. You can watch here live in the auditorium, or you can view over the interwebs on Zoom or live streaming through our Facebook. Thank you for everybody that has come today uh, and for those that are watching online. So. Let's go ahead and get started. I got a lot of slides. Can everyone hear me all right here? We got the air running, trying to keep it cool in the auditorium. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to make sure that everyone can hear me and I'm not getting any uh, advice from my coworker. So I must be doing good as far as for those watching online. Doing great. Excellent, thank you, Christine. So we'll go ahead here. Uh, I've got a lot of slides lined up, a lot of pictures. What I'm going to try and do is give a general overview of this story on light ships off of North Carolina's capes. That's Cape Hatteras, Cape Lookout nearby, and Cape Fear to the south. Um, so let's jump into it here. Here's a satellite image of the coast of North Carolina. I'll point out the three places that I just mentioned, Cape Hatteras, Cape Lookout, and Cape Fear. Now, off of these three capes, um, it's a <clears throat> treacherous, treacherous waters, if you will. Uh, when we think about you know, how things were moving, commerce and people and so on and so forth in the you know, before the country and, and in the early years of our country it was a lot by water it was it was done you know over the water and if you were going north or south along the eastern seaboard you were going from Philadelphia to Charleston or from Savannah to New York you had to go around those capes um, and when we zoom in on a nautical chart for example, this is Cape Hatteras. We see something that's marked here, Diamond Shoal, and then farther out, even Outer Shoal. So these are these are depths in <clears throat> fathoms in the light area of the chart, but the depths over the shaded areas are in feet. 
So I see a eight, six, four, five. Um, that's shallow water. So if you're sailing and you're going north or south along the coast and you encounter these shoals, you better be careful and watch where you're going because you could run aground on the sandbar, be torn up by the waves, and potentially you lose your ship and the cargo, but even worse, your life or the lives of your crew and passengers. Um, so these light ships e existed uh, in order to warn these seagoing vessels and these mariners. Um, I'm not gonna talk about lighthouses. Um, you know, that's a whole separate lecture actually. <laughs> this one, we focus on these light ships. Uh, the lighthouses were great and that was the first attempt to warn uh, captains of these dangerous locations along the coast. But in some situations, especially these capes with the shoals that extended for miles off of them, the lighthouse didn't really help. Um, it was way over here on, on the land. So if you're sailing miles, 15 miles or so off the coast, there were conditions that existed that you might not see that lighthouse. So we needed something else to warn them. Um, a brief little slide about some of the, the, the history of light vessels themselves. Um, if you can see on the slide here, I have the, the earliest record of a light vessel dates back to 200 BC in ancient Rome. And what, what is a light vessel? It's basically a, a boat or something that's floating on the water that has a light on it. What kind of light did they use on that first one? It was fire. <laughs> They had a fire burning on some type of structure that, that, that was marking a dangerous location. So fast forward quite a bit uh, and we're concentrating uh, a, a, little, a little more recent time. Um, you'll see 1820 was the first light ship in the United States stationed in the Chesapeake Bay at Willoughby Spit. Uh, then it moved to Craney Island near Norfolk. Um, that was the first light ship in the, in the United States. So it was after we became a country, um, lighthouses that existed uh, already. Um, there was actually a lighthouse establishment as early as 1789. Um, so then we had, which, which morphed into uh, the lighthouse board, the lighthouse service. And in 1939, these, these light beacons were taken, uh, management was taken over by the, the US Coast Guard. Um, so that, but that one in the Chesapeake Bay, that was like an inshore light ship, even though the bay gets pretty rough um, for as far as uh, sea conditions go. Um, now the first official uh, outside vessel was a few, only a few years later in 1823, and it was off of Sandy Hook, in, the entrance to the New York Harbor. Um, but we want, we want to focus a little more on North Carolina. So I mentioned that the one in the Chesapeake was an inshore light ship. We had those too. And this was my attempt at marking those locations throughout the internal waters of North Carolina. Um, the Pamlico Sound, the Albemarle Sound, the Croatan Sound, um, and even down towards the mouth of the Neuse River. And then we had this outlier down here in the Cape Fear with, uh, as well. Um, but they, they were doing, their service was to, once the ship got in to the internal waters, was to have this navigational aids to help them get to where they were going. If they were going to Edenton, uh, or maybe they were going to, uh, Bath or uh, Washington or New Bern um, or Wilmington, those light vessels were an additional navigational aid uh, that could be seen in poor visibility and conditions and at nighttime. Um, but let's go out to the Capes. Let's go to the to offshore here. And this is that same chart of Diamond Shoals, except I kind of zoomed out on it. Um, I put 1802 right here at Cape Hatteras because that was the year that the first lighthouse was built at Cape Hatteras. Um, 
Now, the first light ship anchored off of Diamond Shoals wasn't until 1824. And it only served for three years. Why? Because it's terrible out there. <laughs> Uh, it, or it can get it can get terrible. Uh, it's not always terrible, but it, but it's very rough conditions. We have uh, the shoals, so any large waves or surf uh, will be breaking on those shoals. Uh, there's very strong currents. Um, Cape Hatteras extends eastward, uh, very close to the Gulf Stream. Um, the Labrador currents uh, just offshore, coming down from the north. Uh, very treacherous sailing conditions can exist there. Um, so after 1827, they they had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what are we going to do with this location. Uh, it's really difficult there. And part of that was that you know they they probably weren't expecting it to maybe be like that and be that difficult to basically anchor a ship to be stationary in that one location. It wasn't an, until 1897 that they finally uh, resume operations there. I put the location on the chart, 15 miles, 128 degrees from the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. It was, this would also be the station off of North Carolina that was the last station to host a light ship. So from 1897 to 1966, there was a light ship off of Diamond Shoals, with a couple of exceptions, and I'm going to jump into, into that here in a second. This list is all of the vessels that were stationed at Diamond Shoals and the years that they were there. You'll notice some overlap. For example, light vessel, that's what LV means. LV 69 and 71, LV 71 and 72. There, it, it doesn't mean that there were two vessels out there at the same time. It means that they were taking turns. It, the conditions were so rough at Diamond Shoals that you'd anchor your light ship out there, it would get beat all to pieces, and then they would have to bring it in for repairs. So in the meantime, they had uh, the other vessel acting as a relief vessel. Take a look at 1942 to 1945. Buoy. There was no light vessel. They just had a buoy out there because of the bow of the Atlantic. The U-boat, the German U-boats that were targeting merchant vessels along North Carolina's coast had already actually attacked an earlier light vessel in World War I. There were U-boats operating off of our coast in World War I as well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit. But so when, when the Second World War came about, they, they learned their lesson and said, let's bring in the light ship. We don't want to lose another one to a attack from a U-boat. And so they set a buoy out there instead. This is a picture of the light vessel 69 that was stationed at Diamond Shoals. It was one of the second vessels. Remember, it took turns with another uh, light ship. Um, now, this picture is not at Diamond Shoals. It was uh, from the last assignment of the LV-69, which was at Scotland, New Jersey. Um, I couldn't find any other, uh, I couldn't find some other pictures uh, of it on the water. So I thought this would be good. Um, and I have a little bit of detail there about, um, you know, it was put on station uh, in, in there from 1897 to 1901. Uh, but we look at the top of this slide, uh, I mentioned something that, that was pretty interesting. And when I, what, at least when, to me, when I've, read about and found out about and some of you probably may already know but in 1889 this was a period where there was no light ship at diamond shoals two hundred thousand dollars was appropriated to build a lighthouse at diamond shoals an, an actual light tower like the one that's on that was on land they wanted to build it out at diamond shoals remember those depths really weren't that bad you could build put a structure out there in eight ten feet of water they wanted to build a lighthouse out there, but they had to build like uh, an encasement and to be able to, to submerge the foundation and stuff. Um, but, but that was eventually abandoned. They realized that that was a pretty crazy idea to build a lighthouse at, on Diamond Shoals. So the money was then used to construct 
this light vessel 69. It was steel frame, but it had a, a wood bottom, but it had steel plated um, top sides. Here's a, a, an example of how rough it could get out there. August 18th, 1899, there was a hurricane. Um, so the, the captain and crew of the light vessel have the engine full ahead. They're, they're anchored, remember, but the current is so strong that it's putting a lot of tension on, on the line. So they basically need to put her in forward and steam just to sit in one spot. If you've operated a boat, you've probably experienced that before with the strong current, um, except this is a pretty large vessel, but I, it doesn't matter the size, I guess. Um, it did, it eventually they couldn't keep up with it and the hurricane uh, causes the line to break and the whole light vessel just goes on this wild ride over Diamond Shoals and comes ashore on Hatteras Island near the U.S. Life Saving Station at Creed's Hill. Everyone's landed safely, thankfully, but I can imagine that that was a harrowing event. In the middle of a very large hurricane, you're already anchored out there off of Diamond Shoals, and you're trying to keep on position, and the next thing you know, you're drifting with the, the surf and the waves uh, straight to the beach. Uh, this is a the clip from the annual report of the United States Life Saving Service from that year. And it goes into detail somewhat about what happened. Um, so you see August 18th was the date. It, it has the name of the, the, the vessel, Diamond Shoals Light Vessel 69, the location of the station crew that were involved, Creed's Hill. And it tells us that the light vessel parted moorings during the terrible storm and stranded at 3.30 in the morning, one mile south-southwest of the station. Surfmen hastened to the scene with the beach apparatus. Check out our exhibit gallery to learn more about the beach apparatus. Um, and they fired a shot line across the wreck and safely landed the crew of nine men in the breaches buoy. That's in the exhibit too. Took them to station in a much exhausted condition and provided them with dry clothing from the supplies of the Women's National Relief Association. They were secured at the station until the next day when having recovered their strength and the storm having abated, they boarded their vessel again. Wreckers were sent for and efforts were made to save the vessel. On September 12th, the weather being rough, the lifesavers assisted the crew to land and secured them at the station until the next day when they were able to return to the wreck. On September 19th, it was necessary for the crew to quit the wreck once more, and the station crew hauled them ashore. This time, they stayed at the station until the 21st, and then they went back on board. Soon afterwards, the Merritt Wrecking Company succeeded in hauling her off the beach and towed her to Baltimore for repairs. Yes. That's the distance they covered on that wild ride over the outer shoals past the Cape Hatteras Point to the near the life-saving station at Creed's Hill. There they are on the beach. This is a photograph from after the storm. Uh, and this may be the crew up here and maybe some of the life savers. I think the, what the wrecker is out here on the water. Obviously the weather conditions had subsided. Um, but this is a pretty cool picture. I'm sure they didn't think it was cool, <laughs> but they're probably just happy they survived. Um, and they were very appreciative of the life-saving crew. They wrote this letter. In behalf of the crew of the Diamond Shoals Lightship, number 69 was stranded near Creed's Hill Life-Saving Station on the morning of August 18th in a hurricane from the Southeast. We, the undersigned, wish to thank the life-saving service for the timely assistance, which was rendered us by the Creed's Hill Life-Saving Crew. At 5 a.m., we discovered the lifesavers coming to our rescue. The weather was thick and rainy and blowing a hurricane. All hands were in the rigging and the seas were breaking completely over the vessel. Completely over the vessel, <laughs> the waves. Pretty gnarly. Huh? <laughs> we were all landed safely and taken to the station in an exhausted condition where we were kindly treated by Captain H.W. Styron and his crew, for which we desire to tender our thanks. 
And there they are, they signed the master, the assistant engineer, the fireman, the cook, and the seaman. Uh, another of the second vessels on station at Diamond Shoals with a LV-71, alternated at the station with the LV-69 and the LV-72. Um, so I mentioned German U-boats. The LV-71 was the one that was sunk by a U-boat. August 6, 1918. Light Vessel 71 reports the presence of a German U-boat that tried to sink a passing freighter. Message intercepted by the U-140, which subsequently fired six shots at the light ship. The U-boat eventually fired several more shots, sinking the vessel. But the light ship's message was received and over 25 ships were able to seek refuge in the Cape Lookout Bight. So they hightailed it southeast and made it into the, the Bight at Cape Lookout, which was a little bit safer place to be. Uh, all on board the light vessel rode to safety. This is a newspaper clipping from the Washington Herald out of Washington, D.C. Uh, it says, the government regards the sinking of the San Diego and the Diamond Shoals light ship as in the fortunes of war category. Both have been replaced. The San Diego sinking was due to a mine that probably was left by the departing U-boats of the previous raid. The light ship was replaced within 48 hours. Uh, the sinkings by the German submarines in this newest campaign off the American coast in the Atlantic have been, and it lists several vessels, including the Diamond Shoals light ship. Okay, here's the LV-72, the fourth vessel to serve at the station. I put a little bit of details about you know, the anchor. It was 7,500 pounds at a 900-foot chain. Uh, at 300 feet from the vessel, a submerged buoy was fastened to the chain. When not on station, LV-71 and 72 would act as relief vessels within their district. So I think that they could go to uh, Cape Lookout and, and maybe farther north if they needed to. Uh, I think this picture is the crew of the light ship as they are maybe going to pick up mail from a passing freighter or vessel. Um, they would lower a boat and row over and exchange pleasantries and, and mail and maybe some supplies. Here's the fifth vessel that was on station at Diamond Shoals, the LV-105. And, and these this text at the bottom here, I was just trying to like paint a picture of um, you know, what these light ships went through. We already know hurricanes and U-boats. Um, there is an example, 1922, during a period of several years, the vessel steamed an average of 300 miles a month while moored. So to prevent dragging the anchor. Uh, March 1 through 8, 1925, during a northerly gale, the vessel is dragged three miles to the south, southeast. Uh, March 2nd, 1927, they're dragged off station three miles in a severe northwest gale, unable to make headway under power that made the station March 5th when the weather moderated. 1928, February 14th, dragged two miles northeast of the station in 60 to 70 mile per hour winds. Um, 1928, September 1819, decks were awash with boarding seas for two days in a southerly gale. November 11th, 1928, 90 mile an hour winds, seas breaking over the ship, dragged off the station, searched six hours for the station buoy in heavy seas. 1932, November 26, dragged three and a half miles off station, gale gusting to 75 miles an hour. 1933, September 15, 16, during hurricane with the engine full ahead, dragged five miles into the breakers on the southwest part of Diamond Shoals. The boats, Lifeboats were carried away, the water above the floor plates in the fire room, the antennas were blown away, the wind shifted and carried the vessels 60 miles east, northeast of Cape Hatteras. Whew. That sounds rough. That 33 hurricane was the one that opened Barden's Inlet when Shackelford used to, was connected to core banks um, before that. Uh, here's the LV-114, the sixth vessel on the station. Um, I had an interesting note on this one that it was the first U.S. light ship to pass through the Panama Canal. From, it was going from Portland, Oregon to New York. I don't know what the occasion was. It could have been built out there. It may have been stationed out there. I don't know. 
when you can get a better look at you know, the lifeboats and the rigging here, the lantern there, lantern there. The next one, the, the WLV 189 of some, th this was a uh, first of six light ships that were designed and built you know, specifically for this purpose to be on, on, to act as a light vessel in a very difficult location. All first of six, all welded light ships ever constructed. It had a high degree of watertight integrity. It was built specifically for Diamond Shoals. And here it is. This is what they call the ducking, where like a little baby duck jumps in the water for the first time, except this is a big boat doing it. <laughs> and if you look at this picture, look at all these people over here. I would like to be there and watch that. That'd be pretty, pretty cool. They were all watching it. The, and it was built in uh, Michigan. I have another angle too. This is from the other side. Um, the the sister ship, the WLV-196, is in the background, waiting its turn for ducking. These were, these were twin ships. Uh, they, were, they were first designed and built by the, by the U.S. Coast Guard uh, af just after it merged with that, that lighthouse service, like I mentioned earlier in 1939. It's putting up a pretty good wave there. This guy's getting the shot. He's holding a camera. Maybe he worked for the local paper or something. <laughs> commissioned in 1946 and oh those are the mushroom anchors see the mushroom anchor there another one there and there is the 189 on station not a very rough day but for me rough enough i don't handle the those i've tried the drama me it doesn't work i just stay close to shore <laughs> So in 1966, they are able to uh, get some funding, the Lighthouse Service, the Coast Guard, uh, if you will, to get these Texas Tower platforms. They were designed for oil drilling operations in the Gulf of Mexico. They could be in 200 and 300 feet uh, depths, but the one that ended up at Diamond Shoals, built in 50 feet of water, the pilings were submerged 150 feet. So they no longer had to worry about a light vessel breaking anchor and drifting away. You could land a helicopter on top. Uh, you didn't have to run an engine to motor in place there. Um, supplies could be brought out by ship. Quite, quite an improvement um, to, the, to those duty stations. Uh, and I love the, this picture because this is the 189, the last light ship on station saying goodbye. And there's the, uh, the tower and there, oh, there's a helicopter right there. So the captain and crew of the light vessel are passing the torch, if you will, you know, the end of an era, uh, era pretty much with the light vessels, you know, kind of becoming obsolete. Your navigational aids are, um, charts have improved, uh, you know, um, different types of technologies that come about that you know, the, the, the vessels are able to withstand uh, tougher conditions for traversing the water, um, all those situations, better weather forecasting. Um, you know, the, these navigational aids were, were slowly uh, become, becoming um, you know, obsolete. A lot of lighthouses today are managed by by parks and state parks and national seashores and, and such, and they're not as necessary anymore. Um, but I'm glad that they keep them because they're a part of our history and, and, and a lot of them are designated as historical landmarks. Um, what happened to the light ship? You know, didn't need it anymore. What are you gonna do with it now? Um, well, for the, the 189, it becomes an artificial reef. <laughs> off the coast of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Here's the picture right, uh, before they sunk the vessel. We know when it settles to the bottom, all types of marine life and, and such uh, start to grow and, and live in, on it and create this 
this artificial reef community that attracts all kinds of sea life. And it's great for providing habitat and, and recreational fishing and um, you know, scuba diving and enthusiasts. And it, this is a postcard that I was able to find through online archives. The, it says the famous diamond lightship, but then it gets it really wrong and it says stationed off the coast of Moorhead City. <laughs> It's like no, and and now I think about it. I wonder if some. I wonder if you know, everyone always debates why the the Cape Lookout Lighthouse it was in the wrong place. It has diamonds. It's supposed to be a diamond shoals, and that's a story for another day. Um, so maybe whoever did this postcard thought that oh well, that lighthouse down there by Moorhead City's got diamonds, so the ship must have been down there. But but I don't know. But you know, when you're a light ship, you know you've made it when they make a postcard of you. A bumper sticker would probably be the next best thing, maybe. I thought this picture was great that I came across. I just pulled it um, from a uh, from the website of the the current owners of the Diamond Shoals Light Tower. Because what happened to the light tower? It was decom decommissioned eventually, and it was up for sale. You could have bought the light tower. I couldn't have. I don't have enough money. <laughs> But somebody could, and somebody did. Um, but this, imagine if that was your duty station. I mean, you're out there. It would feel like you're in the middle of the ocean. I bet the fishing was great. <laughs> and, and, and observing stars at night, or if you're, really, if you're into watching pelagic seabirds or whales, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, here's an up-close shot of it. This is from... I think they're still the current owners, the Zap Water Technology Incorporated. I don't know what they do. I think they want to get into like scientific research or something. Uh, but the light tower sold for seventeen thousand dollars. So it's, it's not really that expensive. Um, it was decommissioned in two thousand one. Looks a little rough for that day. Um, all right, so let's move along here. I don't want to keep you here too long today. Uh, we have the Lookout Shoal Station. This one, not as treacherous as Diamond Shoals, and only actually had uh, two different light vessels stationed there. Um, starting didn't start until 1905. 1812 is the year of the first lighthouse built at Cape Lookout. The it's not the one that's there today. That was 1859. So I, I put that on there just to say, you know, they, they knew it was dangerous enough of a location to get a lighthouse as early as 1812, but it didn't get a light vessel until much, much later. Um, it might have had a, a, a buoy or something out there, I'm sure, maybe, a light. Uh, here's the LV-80, the first vessel of Cape Lookout Shoals. There was a sad moment in the history of that duty station when a, uh, a steamer had actually um, basically just, I don't know if they didn't see them or, or what would happen, but the, the, some of the crew from the light vessel were headed out um, to, to this passing steamer. I guess they were hoping that they could exchange some mail or, or send their mail off or something and the steamer actually hit the the small um, tender boat or, or lifeboat that they were in and three of the five uh, life-saving, I mean, the life, uh, the light vessel crew were, that were on board uh, drowned. So that was July 30th, 1913. Here's the, the LV-107. This was the second vessel stationed out there. And I don't know where this picture was taken. Um, I'm still trying to dig that up and figure it out. But sometimes these pictures that are in archives, they don't have the complete story to it. Could have been at where it was built, could have been somewhere where it was being serviced. So that station's discontinued in 1933 and they replace it with a, a, a bell buoy, which does have a little light on top too. Now that's not the buoy that, that's just similar to, to the one that they used. Um, and what happened to the last 
light vessel there, the, the 107, um, it's decommissioned and it was transferred to Hampton, Virginia for use as a museum. They wanted to set it up as a museum there on the waterfront. Um, it stayed there till about 1980 uh, and it was su supposedly going to New Jersey to the shipbreakers yard, but then someone says, hey, that would make a pretty cool marina office. So the Liberty, Liberty Landing Marina in Jersey City, you can go see the old LV-107. And that's a picture of it there as the, uh, the office to the marina. I think it's still there. Um, so there's, we, we skipped to frying pan shoals that, that was, there wasn't too much detail on the, on the Cape Lookout um, light vessels. Uh, there, there was the location that was, had a station for the shortest amount of time and the, uh, the smallest number of vessels to be anchored there. Um, so the last one that we talk about is the Cape Fear uh, region and the frying pan shoals that extend off of Cape Fear. You can see the year uh, that a, a lighthouse was first built at that location. And then the year that a light ship was first stationed off of frying pan shoals was 1854. From 1860 to 1863, the station was vacant. Uh, L, light vessel number eight was assigned to frying pan shoals, but was seized and sunk in the Cape Fear River by Confederate forces before it could make it to the station. So when you, know, when you first talk about, oh, light ship, it was anchored and what it did and how it warned mariners, there's more to the story. They have this pretty unique history and, and the things that they survived through and went through and you know, this one got sunk before it ever got out to the, to its duty station. Uh, and there's a long list of all the vessels that served at frying pan shoals. And you'll notice again, during World War II, they pulled the ship off and just marked the location with a buoy. Um, here is LV-34. This is the fourth vessel to serve at that frying pan shoals. Uh, again, you'll, this is the only picture I could get of it. This is when it was... Um, serving later off of Charleston, South Carolina. So that's why it says Charleston on it. And I have a few details about the construction materials. Here's the LV-1. This was the 10th vessel for frying pan shoals. Uh, again, uh, the only picture I could locate was when it was uh, in for service up in uh, Nantucket, New South Shoals location uh, at an earlier date, actually. So it was in Nantucket for a while before coming to Frying Pan Shoals. Now I ha had found these drawings of the LV-1. I, I just thought they were interesting and I like the, the lines that they have here. So but I've got some more detail on, you know, this is built 1855, cost $48,000. Um, the, the wood, white, uh, and oak, and live oak. You know, just some, just the specs on it, if you will. Sail schooner rig, fore and main, uh, on the Spencer masts. So this did. This was a sailing vessel. There's these earlier ones. They later would get uh, steam and fuel-powered engines. Notice this right here, that's the hand operated fog signal. So when it gets really bad and the ships can't see you, you gotta get out there and bring the uh, hand operated bell so they can at least hear you and uh, figure that maybe there's a dangerous situation up in that direction. There are more lines from the Light vessel one. I do have a, a picture of that one. I guess I did. Um, this this is the twelfth and last light ship to be at Frying Pan Shoals uh, from nineteen thirty to sixty four. The LV one fifteen, and they get a tower too. Diamond and frying pan get the tower, but not lookout. 
Um, I don't know how they decided that other than, well, Diamond Shoals was the first one you kind of got to if you were headed south and Frying Pan Shoals was kind of the first uh, bad area that you got to if you're going north. Cape Lookout being in the middle, and, um, maybe they figured, oh, well, they've already seen one or the other one. You don't need to put a tower at Cape Lookout. I don't know the exact thinking on it. It's probably written down somewhere deep down in, in the uh, records of the, the Coast Guard. Um, but this is a similar picture when the uh, light vessels leaving the frying pan shoals location. So you're probably wondering uh, what would they do with, what happened with this situation? What happened with these? Oh, look, it gets a postcard. <laughs> the light vessel gets a postcard. This, let's see if they got it right. Frying pan shoals light ship, the center of the best fishing waters off southeastern North Carolina. Well, that might be up for debate, but that's what the postcard says. Um, at least they didn't put frying pan shoals off of Moorhead City. Uh, and that's what happened to the ship. It's a bar and grill off of Manhattan Pier 66. <laughs> So folks up north, they like those light vessels. They turn them into all kinds of things. <laughs> I think they, they saw the name and thought it'd be funny if they had a vessel when they cooked in a frying pan on it or something. Um, what about the tower? You could have bought that one too. Uh, it's a little pricier though, 85,000. 2004 is when it was discontinued. And it is bought um, now by Mr. Richard Neal but I'm not sure if he still owns it, but, but maybe he does. He formed this frying pan tower LLC in the, with the mission to restore the tower. Um, and the way they fundraise, I think, is like you can go out there and stay the night uh, and, they, and you can volunteer and help restore the tower. Um, I, have, I haven't done it, but I really do want to do it. It sounds pretty cool. I mean, when, when, where else can you do that? Go stay on one of these old towers. I think they take you out there fishing if you want, uh, any of those other um, you know, scuba diving, uh, bird watching. Uh, these next last few slides here, I just wanted to kind of paint the picture, uh, if you will, or show you some examples of, you know, the, on those light ships, there were men stationed out there. That's where they spent their time. Uh, for weeks at a time, they would get some leave where they'd be able to go off, uh, get up back, back on the on the land, <laughs> but then they were back out on the ship. Um, so these these pictures are not from uh, light vessels that were stationed off in North Carolina, but they are light vessels that are very much like the ones that were stationed off in North Carolina. So you can you can kind of look at these and imagine you know this was your home for your days and weeks at a time. Um, this picture was taken in 1923. Uh, here's the crew receiving provisions. They needed everything that you needed to survive. They had to take out there and they had to get shipped to them, food, um, whatever they needed uh, to, to conduct their work. Here they are doing the weekly fire and lifeboat drill. They would want to make sure that they were staying up to speed on all their uh, operations. So they would lower in the lifeboat. This is a picture from on the bridge, the ship's wheel. Or... And here's in the engine room. <laughs> At some point, they get radio operations. Oh, maybe you were the lucky fellow that had to climb up to uh, take care of the lanterns. I mean, that's why you're out there in the first place to make sure you had the, the lights going. <laughs> and this is the, the view from, from up there on the right-hand side. And of course, you had to keep Keep your light ship clean. You never knew when they were going to come out and get a picture for a postcard. 
Unless it was probably just busy work. <laughs> but you lived out there. Um, you had some spare time. Um, maybe some of your crewmates played the accordion. Uh, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> or later on, you could watch some television. And you probably had your friend out there too. So I just wanted to end with one of my the, the parting shot of the light ship leaving the, the Diamond Shoals station. Um, I hope that uh, you've enjoyed the presentation and gotten a glimpse or an overview of the light ships on the capes of North Carolina uh, and, and what service was like for those uh, crew members out there uh, and, and, and what eventually happened to them, uh, the ships and, and, and then the towers. Um, and uh, to modern modern day um, bed and breakfast at the frying pan Shoals Tower, if you will. So thank you for coming to the presentation. Um, I will, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them. Um, I don't know that we have any online. I don't think we do. Um, otherwise, uh, you take your time to enjoy the museum today. Uh, I also have that list of our upcoming presentations and lectures here up front on the table and then as well on the desk in the lobby. Um, they can also all be found on our website, ncmaritimemuseums.com. So it looks like I have at least a question here up front. What The question was, what kind of pay did they get? That's a good question uh, and I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, as time went on, the pay went up, but, you know, the cost of everything else was going up, too. So um, I think it was probably a pretty, you know, meager wages, maybe. Um, you know, I, we, I was talking with Mr. Kenneth earlier, uh, and he served in the Coast Guard station, in the Coast Guard service, and he was at, stationed at a lighthouse. Uh, if you don't mind us asking, how was the pay? I mean, good. Uh, the, the question was, how was the pay at the White House? They were saying good, bad, enough, enough to uh, cover the bills. Yeah, that's what they said. 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 Uh, Mr. Kenneth's answer was, "We it was enough that they survived. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, another question, yes. I may know that the Coast Guard takes support making is also uh, supporting one of the frying uh, pan light ship and the light tower in the 60s. Uh, they ran the supply boat for the Coast Guard cutter to move them. Here at okay. And they did that on a regular basis. Excellent. So uh, we had someone that shared with us that the Coast Guard station at Fort Macon, uh, which was the home base of the U the uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutter Cholula. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Cholula yeah. or Cholula. <laughs> uh, and they ran the supplies and relief to the the um, light the light tower. At Fry and the light ship before that uh, switched over to Frying Pan Shoals. Did they also go to Diamond Shoals? Don't know. But, well, thank you though, for sharing that because I didn't. I did not know that I knew about that vessel, but I did not know that that's that was part of their responsibility and operation. Um, yeah, they were out there. They had to get it, get their supplies somehow. So uh, again, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We got we got another question. Yes. Yeah. So we had some other information. So there were some light, they were old light ships. Yes. I bet they did. Yeah, so these were probably decommissioned uh, light ships and light vessel, vessels that obviously you could buy because they went up for sale and people bought them. And, and as we were just learning, they converted them into to homes. And I've, I've seen that done with, with life-saving stations too. 
um, converted to beach houses and offices and restaurants and, 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 and rentals up and down the coast. So that's good to re repurpose and reuse. I like that. <laughs> All right. We got another question? Okay, the question was, how did they get that those vessels to be uh, slid off into the water like that and not fall over? Yeah. And engineers, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I, I, I don't know the exact process and, and how that worked. Um, you know, I, in my mind, I always figured it went down the railway, bow or stern first, but in those pictures, it's going off the side. It's falling to the port or starboard. Um, so I guess the weight of the hull was enough that it made sure that it kept it upright. Remember that these light ships had to exist and, and survive terrible sea conditions and stay upright and not topple over. So I'm guessing that the way that the boat was built, it probably lent to easily handling the ducking. And I say ducking as in, as in duck, like the animal. So they weren't dunking it, they were ducking it. They were, it was just sliding off sideways, hitting the water and then coming back upright, I, I guess. Um, Maybe there's a video of it somewhere too. Maybe I can learn more about it that way. But uh, thank you for these questions, and those are great. Uh, again, thanks for coming today, and uh, please enjoy the rest of your visit to the museum. Have a good afternoon.